I'm Dana Cameron. Thanks for coming back to check out Truly Madly Geekly. And today I'm going to be geeking out about weaving. Weaving is something I love doing. Um, I'll talk more about that later, but it sort of feeds into my uh, love of history and archaeology, um, and I get to learn something new that I don't have to be great at. When you're a writer like I am, when you're doing anything for your living, you have to be good at that. And it's fun to have something where you don't have to be good, but you can still get a pretty good result. Now, I uh, this is not going to be an instructional video. Uh, not at all. I'm just going to be talking about my mechanics so that if I talk about it on a blog post or somewhere else, you all have an idea of what I'm doing. Um, and I recommend that you go to uh, look at YouTube, find someone who is talking about weaving who's a good fit for the way that you learn. I like the Shack Spindle Company. They have a lot of great videos. I like Gist uh, Yarn. They have a lot. And um, one of my favorite books for learning to weave, worked really well for me, was Inventive Weaving for the Little Loom by uh, Sign or Signy Mitchell. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Now, as I said, this is not a, uh, a demonstration video. It's, it's more of a confession. And it's a confession that I absolutely hate knitting. Um, I have tried, well, this yarn, rather sad looking gray yarn, I bought when I was in high school because I was a big fan of Doctor Who. Tom Baker, the fourth doctor, was my first doctor. And I figured, ah, I'll learn how to knit. And then when I'm, I'm good, by the end of high school, I'll have you know, a Doctor Who scarf, measure the pyramids of Mars and things like that. Um, but what it turned out to be was an exercise in frustration and futility because I would inevitably snap the threads or I'd poke myself or something else. And it just was incredibly frustrating. There was nothing fun about it. And rather than having my scarf made by the end of high school, um, I'm still using this ugly gray thread for other projects because I finally realized that knitting was not going to be the thing that worked for me. Maybe I'll get crocheting now that But what I found out watching a weaver, I think it was at the Minnesota State Fair, um, where they have a great textile display and quilting and weaving and sewing and spinning, really cool stuff. And what I realized is like, when you're weaving, you're imposing the order from the outset. Um, you're giving yourself a very specific set of parameters and you've already done a lot of the setup work um, that was confusing me when I was doing, uh, when I was trying to learn how to knit. Uh, because I'd get confused about what thread was going where and then again, things got stabby. So uh, I realized that I needed to try weaving for myself because I uh, love textiles, I like studying them, I like just touching them. I know, you know, that's a thing for uh, all kinds of crafters is you want to touch the fibers and, and, and that sort of thing. So what I did was uh, I realized that you could basically uh, take a leaf from an historical or a prehistorical book and just start weaving with some dowels and some string or a tree branch and some string. You weighed it down. You could start weaving today if you wanted to using just either sticks that are supported somehow and yarn. And, um, or even make it a little, a little swatch loom out of cardboard. There are plenty of uh, easy ways to get weaving right away. And some people have entire rooms of their house. They have barns dedicated to looms that are the size of, of, of upright pianos. Um, and I have a small house, and so I was going to go someplace in between them. I did not want to start with just doing, uh, you know, something very basic, because I wanted to have the machine, the loom itself, help me out, impose that order that needs to be there. Um, and I ended up getting uh, a toy, um, basically, to start to make sure that it was something that I was going to like. And this is a very small, rigid head of loom. You put the, the yarn, the warp, the long parts across here, and then you move this to raise and lower them while you're weaving the weft thread that goes from side to side. And it is exactly like the sort of weaving you might have done in grade school, where you take two pieces of paper and overlap them and then overlap and underlap and overlap and underlap, and you have weaving. And that can be happening with wool and with uh, linen and cotton and tree fiber and all kinds of stuff. Now, the great thing about using a little toy with A, it made sense for me because I knew, I knew I was gonna enjoy it because even doing something as small as that, I could get a product, I could, I tried making a towel, you know, the cotton's too thick, but it worked. And then if you have a very long piece of that, or you have three shorter pieces, you can stitch them together and get um, a whole whole different thing, whole textile, and you can um, 
get usable stuff from even a very small loom. Uh, you think about kente cloth and how that's mostly strips. Uh, the same with kimono cloth. Very uh, traditionally a, a narrow strip of fabric and you build them up that way. So using a little loom worked really well for me. I mentioned um, rigid heddle before. Oops, I'm going to over here. And these things right here, the plastic things, the holes and the slots, those are the heddles. Um, this whole device is called a reed. And uh, before there were rigid heddle looms, you would just uh, make a heddle out of loops of cloth along that uh, that uh, tree branch or that um, dowel that I mentioned before. And then you raise and lower your threads that way. This is a repurposed magic wand. Um, it doesn't really make any extra magic for it, but it allows me to manipulate the threads the way I was discussing. Uh, some of the, uh, I mentioned being able to piece fabric together to make a bigger square piece. And with my little loom that I eventually bought, um, Another rigid heddle loom could make napkins and get quite different texture with using using different material, quite fancy. And again, this is only using a small loom that I have at home, or even just you know the way you vary the colors and the patterns. You can get quite a lot of cool effects. Um, and so, I bought my first loom uh, about two years ago, I think, and. Uh, it is a shacked rigid heddle loom. It's a flip. Um, I'll show you over there uh, about it, but um, it's about 20 inches wide and it folds up so I can put it in the hallway and it will be done. I bought another loom, which is even smaller, 16 inches wide. And the great thing about that is I can actually break it down and its stand, put it into a bag and take it with me. And it sets up again in like five minutes. So uh, it's really nice to have one, the bigger loom for bigger projects that are more complex. And I can have a smaller one for either uh, you know, traveling or whipping up something pretty quickly. So uh, it's a nice option. Still works in a small house. Uh, I mentioned before that I like uh, weaving for a number of reasons. Part of it is because it has a lot of the same things in archaeology. <laughs> I, talked about inter Oop. I talked about intersecting lines and weaving. So there's a lot of measuring. There's a lot of uh, focus on organization and structure. So, measuring tips. We know I love measuring tips. If you saw the last series when we excavated my kit bag. Um, lots of different types of string and lots of note keeping because you make a project, you might want to try it again or you might want to learn from your mistakes. So you, you keep a little diary with what you used, what kind of loom you used, what kind of um, dimensions, what you might do different next time. It's incredibly useful. I go back to my little uh, weaving diaries all the time. So I think the next thing is for me to talk about what I'm going to do next. Uh, I'm going to get this project set up and I'm going to be using a slaying hook. Now I was terribly excited when I heard about slaying but uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with Buffy the Vampire Slayer and it doesn't have anything to do with Dr. Zhivago either. Um, it's a hook that's used to pull the yarn loops from the back of the loom to this warping peg right here. This is the part where I make the long length of the textile I'm going to make. And you write it back and forth between the loom, the loom and the uh, warping peg. And this is the most intense and most repetitive and maybe not the most fun part. It's kind of like when you're painting a room, you get all excited to put color up and everything, but then you have to do all the preparation work first and patching and there's a lot of a lot of work that goes in before you have to you can do the fun stuff and start seeing things happen and come together. So I will be starting um, with my loom uh, and I will tell you a little bit about that. The um, you can see here uh, it's got the rigid heddle that I uh, mentioned before. It's actually kind of fun because it's got a little tray here so I can put stuff which is incredibly handy. Um, I have this uh, shoelace here because uh, it keeps the, the, the reed from moving around and it keeps the, um, the uh, oh gosh, not the bar, the dowel thing I'm pointing to here, uh, from moving around until I get it started. Um, I do name my looms. Uh, this one, um, I couldn't decide whether to call it Stormbringer 
or Stormbreaker. One Stormbringer uh, is Elric's sword. Stormbreaker was Thor's axe. And depending on how I'm feeling about my weaving that day, I am either, um, there's a storm one way or the other. Either it's making me feel calm and relaxed and I can get back to work, or it's making me even angrier and the cats learn even more new and inventive swears. So, I've got my thread and I'm going to start, I'm going to start slaying. And this is a repetitive process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the, the loop of thread, I'm going to put the slaying hook through there, grab it through, and I'm going to put it around the warping peg. Now, if you have cats, this is a, uh, a bit of a challenge because you want to do it either when they're sleeping or happily distracted with something else because it's yarn. And even though my cats have never seen yarn before, they were into it. So I'm going to take the first color and go through and warp it up. that I, um, I'm alternating colors in order to create sort of a, a, a checkered pattern. So every so often I finish one color and I'll put in the next one. I'm dividing all these up by uh, a couple of stripes of, of, of white here. I should also uh, show that these are cones of um, cotton yarn. And it's kind of cool because they were I guess organically farmed uh, examples of cotton, and they have natural dye in them, so they'll actually be brighter once you wash them. Something else you might have noticed is down here, I have um, some sandbags. That's to help keep the, the loom nice and straight because you want to make sure that everything is straight so everything comes out about the same length in the warp. There's an expression that a yarn under tension is a yarn under control. And uh, I will not make the obvious talk about write, uh, writers being under tension, um, but it's very important. It's one of the things to keep track of. So I'm swapping colors, and I'm alternating. Now, you can see in the read, too, you have, um, I need to check every so often to make sure I'm getting a loop through each one of these slots and each one of those holes. Uh, for a lot of projects, you do that when you want something to be fairly, if you're using a fine thread or if you're using, um, yeah, if you're using fine thread. Uh, in this case, I want to give the, the um, napkins I'm making a bit of, uh, a little bit of drape to them because they can get quite dense otherwise. But that's the other good thing I like about it. Um, if you are weaving, and you make a mistake. There are lots of ways to fix it, but then um, you will still have a thing that largely works as you intend it to be, even though you have an error in it. If you skip a thread, for example, you can replace the thread. Or uh, if you have an extra thread, um, it's not going to affect the object at all. And in fact, I've developed the habit of saying, if anyone can find you know, a mistake in this, I'll give you a quarter because it still works like a napkin or it still works like a towel.
tabby who walk through appears to be disinterested, but we know from prior experience that she's merely settling her battle plan. One of the things uh, you should know too is that this, uh, I'm about halfway done and I've already walked about 2,700 steps. And so I've got another 2,700 steps to go. Um, so yeah, you get your exercise, uh, which, and it can be a bit higher in the back. There are different ways of warping that make it easier um, or more comfortable, but this is the one I'm most familiar with and the one I'm most comfortable with. But um, yeah. You'll get your steps in. That took about uh, an hour and a half. My watch is letting me know that I've got almost all my steps in for the day. Um, but what I need to do now is to get all the warp threads off this peg and onto the back beam. We're gonna wind it up. Now, that usually takes some assistance because you need to keep this taut. Um, you can also see that not all the threads are exactly the same tension and that's fine because there will be several opportunities for me to correct that and there are ways to fix it if you find out that that's gotten away from you from earlier uh, later on um, but for now I am going to ask Mr. G to take the yarn off the warping peg and I'm going to wrap a piece of a long piece of brown paper in between each layer of threads as it goes around the, um, the back beam and that way it's going to keep everything as organized and tidy and you won't have threads grabbing on each other and making a mess. So that's what we're going to do now. And you see I have a piece of paper there you go. just about the same width as my warp. Now see, I, if I'd been smart, I would have measured from the center and figured out exactly how how to center this, but it's not too far off. Um, and I was very busy just trying to get this thing set up, so um, no harm done, but usually it's better to have it as centered as you can. And now is the dangerous part. So I'm going to start winding this back. So far, everything looks okay. And now I'm just going to get the warp threads overlapping each other. And so we want to keep that from happening. And every once in a while I can give it a bit of a, a tug to make sure that you know, keeping it as even the tension as possible.
was going pretty well right up until the end. <laughs> and I probably should have unrolled it and put it back in. I don't think there's going to be a problem. But um, I'm not a professional and I'm not particularly accomplished at this, but I do have a lot of fun trying to figure out a project I want to make and how to make that happen. And I learn a lot every time. Um, that's not the worst warping job I've ever done. I thought I would never understand how to put all the thread onto the loom in the right order and the right spacing and everything. And I'm still learning, but I mean, that was a lot smoother than it's been many times. So for now, that is a wrap on the warp. And the next step will be to actually start weaving. This is Dana Cameron. Thanks for watching to the end of the video. If you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to hit subscribe and to click on the bell icon so you get notifications. If you'd like to support me as a writer and creator, there are links to my books with information about them below. You can order them from your favorite bookstore or your favorite ebook retailer. Thanks again.